Thank you, Guido. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm glad to see a full house. And if I could get the lights, Paula. Um, how many of you have been to China before? Okay. How many of you are from China? <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm going to have to get used to having this monitor in front of me here, so bear with me. Um, but the title is uh, Simple Innovative Practices to Get High Quality Fruit to the Early Market in China. That's the topic what we'll be discussing today. And obviously you know that the United States and China have very strong ties. And uh, just um, the 18th to the 20th, uh, President Hu Jintao paid a state visit to Washington, D.C. and spent time with President Obama discussing lots of important issues that re relate to our uh, bilateral relations as, as important countries. And when I think about America and China as a scientist and as a person, there's a lot that we can learn from each other at the level of individual people. And, um, you know, as I spent time in China with scientists and even with growers, I'm just reminded that they're, just, they're people just like us uh, that are trying to make a living and have a better life. And like many of us, there may be policies and, and programs of the government that the people don't agree with. And, and I think if we were to survey everyone in this room, there'd be at least something about our government that we don't like, right? So uh, you, don't, you don't hold people accountable for necessarily for the decisions of their government. They're, they're people just like we are. So one of the things that I was asked to do when I was in China was to speak about the land grant model that we have here and how it's been successful. And I spoke at some different universities talking about that. And one of the things that I observed while I was there was the tremendous ingenuity of very simple farmers in China and ways that they have developed to, to be profitable. Um, it's great to learn about other, other countries and people, uh, their cultures and history, and, and one of the ways that you do that is by actually going there. And so for those of you who are still students and you're looking for opportunities to travel abroad, I'd en encourage you to do that. It will really broaden your horizons. And uh, I've been to China four times now, and each time I'm reminded of the fabulous hospitality of the Chinese people. I've never experienced better hospitality in any place I've ever visited. So here's China. And uh, current estimate of the, of the population of China is approaching 1.4 billion people. <clears throat> so that's about four Chinese to every American. And uh, if you go on to the CIA World Factbook and you're interested to find some statistics comparing uh, China and the United States currently, um, in terms of the gross domestic product real growth rate, we're at a negative level in the United States right now, and China's approaching 10%. And they've been averaging about 8 to 10% over the last four to five years, so their economy is really growing. Now, this is an interesting statistic, just comparing the proportion of the population that that's has jobs in agriculture, forestry, and fishing. In the United States, it's less than 1%, and in China, it's about 40%. So a lot of people are involved in agriculture, forestry, fishing. This is an interesting figure, public debt. Uh, right now, it's about 53% of our gross domestic product in the United States. It's about $13 trillion, if you can count that many zeros. In China, it's about 17%, and it's about uh, 347 billion. So we're about 39 times proportionally more in debt than China is. That's scary. Uh, in terms of the unemployment rate, uh, here we're approaching 10% and China's about 4%. So there's, this will just give you some differences in, in, in our countries right now where we are as of 2009. And um, China is really growing. Uh, I had the privilege of editing a book on peaches and we published that in 2008. And one of the, one of the chapters I'm most proud of is a history of, of uh, cultivation of peaches in China that was written by colleagues of mine from China. Getting a lot of original uh, literature that was published in Chinese actually translated into English for the first time. And they've actually been growing ch peaches in China since, for over 3,000 years, since before Israel's King David. So it's, a, it's where peach is native. It's a very uh, important fruit crop in China. And um, in 1850, there was a Chinese cultivar here. They, we just called it the Chinese cling that was introduced to the United States. And this is actually 
um, the progenitor of two of our most important cultivars for many years, uh, Georgia Bell and Alberta. So they actually came from this Chinese claim. In China, it's the white peach that's most popular, as opposed to the yellow flesh peach, which we eat here in the United States, primarily. And it's a symbol of long life in the Chinese culture. And this is a this is Xiu Qing, uh, the god of longevity, and he has the peach of immortality in his hand. This particular statue here was about 400 years old. So this is well uh, adapted in their culture, and if you have a, a grandmother or a older relative that's having a birthday, you, you probably would make a, a peach cake or something that's like, be reminiscent of peach as a way of expressing your love and uh, best wishes for a long life. This is a graph showing peach production in the United States starting in about 1960 and coming up to about 2008. And this line here, this is China. They produce about 45% of the world's peaches now. And if I was to show you the graph for apples or pears or grapes or several other fruits, it would look almost the same. Um, we produce about 5%. So that gives you some perspective in terms of peach production in the world. And um, our latitudes are very similar. Our land area is similar. And um, both countries are great places to grow peaches. I wanted to give a little bit of background on this whole topic of protected cultivation, because that's going to be what I'm going to speak about in, the, in our presentation today. First, talking about horticultural crops in general. So this isn't just fruit. This is fruit, vegetables, ornamentals, uh, anything that would fall under that umbrella. Uh, most recent estimate is that there's over 3 million acres being grown in protected cultivation in China. You think about that number. What does 3 million acres look like? It's immense. Um, they're using multi-span greenhouses, which would be similar to what we have here in the States. Uh, they're using high and low tunnels and energy-saving solar lean-to type greenhouses. And I'll show you what these look like. I'll have a lot of pictures of that. These face, face in a southerly direction for maximal sunlight absorption. Some of them are elaborate, but most of them are very simple. Um, and we'll look at pictures of those. Uh, the elaborate ones have brick, cement, steel. The simple ones basically have a dirt, berm, and bamboo. And uh, that's the, the majority of what's used in the industry. And they typically look like this. So, on the north side of the house, you have a wall, and it's uh, most of the time it's dirt. You have a dirt floor, and then you have a roof that comes up like this, and then a span that comes down to the ground, which could be bamboo, it could be rebar, it could be aluminum conduit, and then plastic is laid over top of that to create a very simple greenhouse. And these greenhouses are not heated supplementally, and they're not illuminated supplementally. So it's just a, a place where it's absorbing sunlight throughout the day, and the ground here and the ground here absorbs all that heat. And then the plastic traps that heat in there. And at night, a blanket is rolled down over top to keep the heat inside the greenhouse. And the purpose is to advance the crop. And I'll explain how that occurs in just a minute. This is what one looks like in real life. And uh, the owner here and his daughter are walking along the top. And these are these mats that are rolled down at night to keep the heat in. And then this would be a more typical of what a high tunnel would look like, a very simple high tunnel greenhouse, and those are peaches growing inside there. Now, they've actually been growing uh, peaches in protected cultivation in China now for almost 20 years. So it's not a new industry. It's a very mature industry. And predominantly using these solar lean-to greenhouses and high tunnels, it's the main way they do it. The trees are planted high density, so they're about three feet apart in the row and maybe three to four feet apart between the rows, so they're very close. And they begin harvesting fruit in the second year. And what you can do with this system is you can advance the fruit anywhere from 20 to 90 days. That means fruit earlier on the market. And by doing so, um, that you, you can increase the value of the crop and the profitability to the farmer very significantly. In fact, up to five times increase in, in value. And uh, they're not concerned about size, so the fruit are typically small. But because they're early, everybody's excited to have early fruit, and they, they're not worried about them being huge. Because they're grown under plastic, you don't have problems with rainfall. So rain-induced cracking, which is a problem with nectarines, is not an issue. 
And uh, you can avoid cold damage that can occur in the springtime because it's a warm environment. And there are literally hardly any pest or disease issues to deal with in the greenhouse. So they, as far as I know, they typically have one insecticide application in the spring, and they're not using really any pest control at all. It's effectively organic. Um, when you travel in the airport, you can find fruit on display. Um, this was in the Beijing airport. These are some of the white flush nectarines here, and these are some of the yellow flush nectarines that are grown in the greenhouse. And depending on the volume or the weight, these were selling for anywhere from $25 to $45 per small container, U.S., and people are buying it. So obviously the people who buy this fruit are, are affluent. Now, in terms of where the protected peach industry is, uh, it's primarily in these provinces here. And that's where I was visiting when I was in China. Um, in Shandong province, there's about 5,300 hectares of uh, protected cultivation peaches. That's the largest area, so Shandong is here. Um, and then I'll just show you the other provinces where they're being grown here. You can see on the table. And uh, that amounts to about 33,000 acres just for peaches and nectarines. That's equivalent to the, the amount of peaches and nectarines that are grown in Georgia and South Carolina outside combined. This is just in greenhouses. So it's a very large acreage. It's about 80% nectarines. 20% peach, and the average farmer has one to two of these greenhouses. So it's not big, huge corporate farms like we have here in the United States. Uh, the system can be productive for 10 or more years. So they will plant an orchard in there, and they will harvest that orchard every year for over a 10-year period. Uh, you can intercrop with strawberries. I did see that. They do use some plant growth regulators. This is paclobutrazol they use to help advance flowering to increase the number of flower buds and fruit weight. Um, they, do, they do various prunings throughout the year to remove a portion of the canopy to help keep the trees small. They do summer tipping, which basically you, you remove the uh, apical meristem and it causes the shoots to branch. They girdle in the fall. They apply artificial drought stress. And then they have dwarfing rootstocks and dwarfed cyan cultivars that they use that will help to keep the trees small. So it's a, it's a unique system. So how is it possible to get fruit on the market eight to nine weeks early? That's the, that's the first question. How do they do it? Well, um, they use these passive solar earthen greenhouses. They're very simple, but they're very energy efficient. And the plastic is removed off the house after harvest. So they don't have plastic on them year round. And in the fall, after the leaves drop, and after some of the, the cold requirement is satisfied in the winter, then the plastic is reapplied. And then they use these insulation mats and they roll them down during the day and up at night. And what that does is it keeps the greenhouse cool in that late fall, early winter so that they can continue to accumulate chill hours. And then once the chilling requirement is satisfied, then the mats are rolled up during the day and they're rolled down at night so that the maximum amount of heat can be absorbed in that greenhouse. That's how they do it for the eight week, eight to nine week advancement. And they can ventilate, and I'll show you what this looks like as we go through. So basically what they're doing is, is this is a, a typical dormancy diagram that I would teach my fruit class about fruit trees. And you come into the fall here, and eventually the leaves are gonna drop. Then you have a period of time throughout the winter where the plant is dormant, and in the at least in the first part of the winter, the buds are accumulating cold temperature, temperatures below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's this, each cultivar has a requirement. It could be 1,000 hours. It could be 800 hours. It varies. But once that chilling requirement is satisfied, the only thing that's necessary for the buds to then begin to grow and for the tree to bloom is warm temperature. And so basically what they're doing with this system is they're moving everything backwards so that we're actually having blooming in this time frame here, as opposed to where it would normally be outside. And then everything, of course, has progressed forward from there. Uh, I was invited to speak at a conference in Shanghai in August of 2009, and uh, met many scientists, many Chinese scientists who work with peaches. And one of the things that was presented at the conference was this whole area of protected cultivation. And I talked with several of these scientists at the conference, and I asked them if there was any chance I could come and see it in real life. 
And uh, one gentleman organized the trip, and several of the men that are in the picture uh, were hosts of me. So that's me here. And this is one of this is the fellow from Beijing, and I'll just show all the arrows of these different guys. These are all people that I met at that first conference that then who were hosts of me the second time I went, which was um, in April and May of, la of last year. And basically, uh, it's my official invitation letter, and these are all the places I went. And it was a, a whirlwind tour uh, in two weeks, visiting all these different places and seeing the industry in real life, not just at a, a government facility or at a university. So we're looking at about almost 8,000 miles to get to China. While I was in China, um, I write a column for the American Fruit Grower magazine, and I was talking with the editor there, and he said, well, have you ever considered doing a blog? I said, well, I knew what a blog was, but I'd never done one. And so he sort of twisted my arm and said, why don't you do one while you're in China? And we can arrange it, and you can send the text to our editor, and, and you can send upload the pictures. And so basically, while I was in China, this blog was, was an ongoing project. And every night when I'd get home to the hotel room, probably 9, 10 o'clock at night, I'd go through my two or 300 pictures and choose 30 or 40 and write the text up and send it by email, and they would post it up on the web the next day. And that meant a lot of lo late nights and not a whole lot of sleep, but I'm glad I did it because it, it was really effectively a diary of my trip. And there's over 300 pictures there. You can see in a lot more detail the things that I experienced than I have time to talk about in this presentation. So that's online even now. First stop was Beijing, which of course is China's capital. I spent two days there. And Beijing's a humongous city. Uh, there's actually 70, more than 70 universities in Beijing. Think about that. Um, of course, it was the host of the 2008 Olympics. I was driving in a taxi, and in the taxi there was a magazine, and I opened up this magazine, and there's a sand sculpture of, of President Obama in the Capitol building back here, and it, it says, change has happened. And I'm driving around Beijing, and I'm thinking, change is happening here. <laughs> China is changing. And uh, you'll see some evidence of that as we go through the presentation today. Uh, they had an Apple store in, in the airport. You could buy an iPhone there and whatever you want. As we traveled around many of the major cities, what was amazing to me was the number of apartment buildings that were being built around the perimeter of the city, of every city. And in one place on the highway, the interstate, I decided to count the number of cranes that were uh, there in a 30-second period, and I counted 35. It's just a staggering rate of growth that is, is nothing like you, you've ever seen. And there's a lot of nice automobiles on the road. Um, most of the cars that I saw were less than five years old. If they were older than that, they were probably a taxi. First stop was um, a place called Legends of the Fall, which was like a, uh, it was a, a district-owned sort of an entertainment farm. And this is not typical of the uh, stuff that I saw out in the real world, but this was our first stop. They had this giant strawberry there as you came in. And these were some of the protected uh, cultivation greenhouses there. They had strawberries in one. Uh, this is a cultivar we actually grow in South Carolina. They would bring in these uh, portable pollination units to facilitate pollination of the strawberries because otherwise bees wouldn't get in there. And then uh, they were growing them hydroponically here, as we can see. Pretty sophisticated operation. And the fruit quality was excellent. Very, very good quality fruit, beautiful. They were growing mulberries, which of course the leaf of the mulberry is, is the food for the silkworm. And uh, these were two-year-old trees that had a lot of fruit on them. And uh, they had a playground for children, a petting zoo. And they said, I think they had about 80,000 visitors a year that would come from Beijing to this place on the, in the outskirts to uh, enjoy their time and pick fruit and have fun. So we went to the train station and then we were heading off to our next stop. Uh, this was a more traditional type train. I have been on a high speed rail train in, in China before, but on this trip I didn't make that, that trip. So we traveled by train and they had flat panel uh, TVs in there. You could watch a movie while we were traveling. And we went to Chengli, which is in Hebei province. It's right here, it's just about on the coast. And uh, that was a beautiful place. This is just some scenery from the train ride. 
And uh, these are all, all these uh, high tunnels here, everything that you can see there, this is all grapes for fresh eating. And that was just one snap as we're flying along on the train. This is our group, um, and uh, we went to visit some protected cultivation greenhouses to see uh, fruit growing. And this is what it looks like before the house is actually completed. So they, there's, this whole area is excavated. You've got a, you have a large um, dirt back wall here, and then you have a back wall of an adjacent house here. So imagine this back wall would be similar to the back wall here, and this back wall here would match up with this back wall of this house over here. And then the superstructure comes over top with the plastic, and that's basically your greenhouse. So the trees are already in the ground. And this would be one house beside the next house like that. And you can see it's just a dirt berm. These are straw mats that are rolled down. That would be the west wall. So this is all facing south, so that you get maximum sunlight absorption throughout the day. And they were typically about 100 meters long and anywhere from 30 to 40 meters wide. And then that's the insulation blanket that's rolled down. Some places they'd roll them down nightly by hand. Other places they had a simple motor that they would use, like here. We're not talking high tech. And you want to go inside? <laughs> All right, here we go through the back wall. We're coming through the back dirt wall, and now we're inside. And uh, this would be the earthen back wall. This is a bamboo roof here. And then these are bamboo poles coming down. Uh, I only saw one house that actually had any erosion problem with the soil. This, so I took a photograph of it, but this was not typical. This is the only time I ever saw it. And in some cases, they'd have a stone back wall, which obviously would be a little bit more sturdy. And uh, cement support beams to, keep the, to support the bamboo poles, because when you roll those mats down over top, they, they have considerable weight. So you need to support the structure for that. And uh, then they would tie, tie the limbs into a horizontal position so they could absorb more sunlight and get better fruit quality. All that's handwork. And then in some places I saw rags on the bamboo if it was possibly a rubbing spot which might cause a hole in the plastic. Uh, that wasn't, I didn't see that everywhere, I just saw that at this one particular house. And then in some places they would put bags on the fruit when they're small so that it would protect the fruit from any kind of abrasion or damage and, and have a very nice finish on the fruit. That wasn't particularly common, but I did see it. And this is just some of the fruit on two-year-old trees that are starting to color, and they were very attractive. Of course, we have to taste it. And uh, this was uh, second week of April tasting peaches. So this was pretty early for me compared to what we have here in South Carolina. And this is the farmer, uh, his wife and daughter, and they managed that house themselves, and that was what they did for a living. That was their business. We also saw plums, apricots. Uh, they girdle the trees in the fall so that they would, uh, so to promote um, better size of the fruit the next year. And in most places, they had something growing up the back wall. It could have been tomatoes or, or other crops. They were utilizing all that greenhouse space to grow food. Now, I mentioned also that um, some cases they're growing fruit uh, and getting an advance of crop about four weeks. So they have a different system for that. They're using these high tunnel greenhouses. And uh, in a similar way, they remove the plastic after harvest. And then in the wintertime, after the leaves have dropped and after, after the chilling requirement is completely satisfied, then they reapply the plastic. And then they roll the mats up during the day to absorb heat, roll them down at night to conserve energy and advance the crop. And they can ventilate as necessary. And that's what one of the houses would look like with the mats up on top. So it doesn't have a, a dirt berm on one side. It's, 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 a, it's a contiguous hoop from one side all the way to the other. And then they can open up the sides here with, uh, for ventilation. This is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, this is the particular farmer here. And some of the white peaches are just beautiful. Very high quality fruit. Next, uh, we came around. Um, into Liaoning and ended up in Dalian, which is out on the peninsula here in the, in the ocean, a beautiful city. Uh, at the institute there, they had one of these signs that, you know, the, the text can sort of go like this across the sign. 
and the one young man programmed it so it would have a nice greeting for me. That's never happened anywhere I've ever been in my life. So I thought, wow, I must be like a celebrity or something. And that was, that was really cute. But this is some of the coastline. It's a beautiful city. If you ever go to China, go to Dalian. And this is a view from, so if, if I was just taking a picture of the ocean this way and I turned backwards 180 degrees, so this is the skyline of the city in the other direction. A beautiful spring day, people were out enjoying themselves. Uh, this was a little robot-driven rickshaw. <laughs> and uh, this little girl was going for a ride. And you can see, there's mom and there's dad. They aren't too far away, so. But it was pretty fun to watch that. And there was this giant cement sculpt. Well, I guess it was, it's supposed to be like an open book. Yet people go out there and they're looking at the sea. And there are guy on, guys on rollerblades and skateboards going up and down this thing and having a grand old time. And this, is, this was a sculpture on the side of the, the hill that I went past. So just amazing things you see in China. And in Dalian, of course, there are people who have money. And you get farther away from the city out into the rural areas, and it's more kind of like this. So there's a, there is discrepancy between the rich and the poor. While we were there, we visited a commercial facility where they were growing sweet cherries in greenhouses. And this was privately owned. Uh, this was an expensive operation in terms of the investment into the structures. They were cement. They were tall. Uh, they were growing cherries that had been developed at the institute that I visited there. And uh, very high quality fruit. The, the fruit are, are in the process of coloring now, but they were beautiful and they were large. And they could get anywhere around $50 a pound for them in the market. And these are two containers I saw. Uh, this was uh, $100 for this container and about $174 for this container. So I converted from the Chinese RMB to American dollars. And they're selling them. People are buying them. They're not necessarily taking it home for their personal family consumption. They're probably buying it for a gift for somebody. But uh, there's, there's more demand than there is fruit. We went out for lunch at a restaurant, and what's typical if you're at a seafood-type restaurant, you go and you pick what you want before it's prepared. You point to the fish you want. And so that's what everybody's doing here. And uh, the fish was always presented whole. And then you just use your chopsticks, and you, you dissect part what that you want to eat, and you share around the, around the table. This was a carp. It was so big it couldn't even fit on the, fit on the plate. But I did have a Coke, my <laughs> carp. It was delicious. And then we had octopus, and this was served cold, and uh, it was good. It had a hot dipping sauce, and it was actually really good. I, I enjoyed that. Next stop was Tai'an, so we're here. This is in Shandong province, and this is our group. This is uh, Professor Peng. He's the scientist there that I interacted with. And one of the protected cultivation greenhouses we looked at there. We're inside. This is the owner. This is his uh, uncle. And they run this operation together. They had uh, five houses, and they were building a sixth one. And they, the plastic is tip, typically laid like in three separate strips, so you can open it up for ventilation. And that's what he's showing us here. And then if you look at this picture, you can see under where my laser is, there's something red under there. That's this. That's this nectarine. So that's what it looks like when you look through the plastic. This gentleman was interesting because he had a teenage daughter who helped him in the business, but be because he's a farmer living in rural China, the government allows him to have a second child. And here's this little boy, and he was very proud. This young lady's out uh, hand pollinating commercial peach trees with a little vial here and a paintbrush because this particular cultivar from Japan produces very little pollen, and the pollen that it does produce is usually not viable. So it doesn't set fruit unless you hand pollinate it. So obviously it's profitable for her to do that um, because of the value of the crop. And this is just some of the countryside there in that particular county. In that province, they have more peaches than in all of the United States. And in this one county, there's more peaches than in all of Georgia and South Carolina combined. Very important industry. This is the housing area where the people lived. Visited the, uh, in the university, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I was invited to give a, a departmental seminar. The only problem was it was Sunday morning. <laughs> that was the only day I could give it. And uh, the dean basically said, you know, to all the pomology graduate students, you need to be there. 
So there were over 30 students in this seminar on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And they were bright, and they had lots of good questions, and it was a delight for me to be able to speak with them. And we, we, they asked questions in English. That was a requirement. So uh, we had a lot of fun. While we were there, we went and visited Taishan Mountain, went up this cable car to the famous mountain of that city. And there's a Buddhist temple up at the top, and uh, got to see people uh, putting in their, their sacrifices here in this, these huge ovens. And uh, these are two of the graduate students there that uh, took me up the mountain that day. It was cold. I, I left my jacket in the car, and I wish I hadn't done that. And up at the top of the mountain, they had a restaurant. They had places where you could buy souvenirs. I couldn't believe that all this stuff ended up at the top of this mountain somehow. Uh, but it was very impressive. And uh, this fellow comes up to me, and he, he, wants my, he wants to have a picture with a Westerner. So uh, I said, sure. And, and you can see this thing hanging around my neck. You see how it's kind of sort of whipped up like this? It's because it was really windy, and it was cold. But I had a wonderful time up there. So this, I saw this in my hotel. It's, a, it's sort of the slogan for Shandong province. It says, friendly Shandong. And I can, I can say, yes, indeed. It is a friendly, friendly place. Next, uh, we went to Anhui province and uh, Dangshan County, which is a very famous place for growing Asian pears. And the industry there is changing gradually to protected cultivation of stone fruits. Uh, primarily was an Asian pear area, but now because the, these uh, nectarines and peaches grown in greenhouses are a whole lot more profitable, a lot of the land that was formerly in Asian pears is changing. And uh, we were part of a group. There were about uh, four cars that traveled together. I was in the number two car, and the big boss was up in this car. And uh, we went out and visited real commercial orchards there. Uh, this would be a high tunnel beside a commercial orchard on the left, uh, an, an outside orchard. And this I showed this picture before, but that's what a typical high tunnel would look like in this area. And uh, when they do their summer pruning, they just throw the shoots out on the ground on the outside here like this. And if they want to ventilate, they have different ways they can ventilate. They can pull up the sides or they can pull them down in the middle to get good air circulation. In one house, I saw they had some reflective film on the, on the ground there to reflect more sunlight back up to help improve the coloration of the fruit. And it was all flood irrigated. So they would turn the water on and flood the whole house and let, allow the water to seep in. And they turn the water off. And they would do this at whatever intervals were necessary to make sure the trees had adequate water. This particular guy here, he's about 26 years old, and he was a real entrepreneur. And he's showing me how he has his trees trained to central leader to a bamboo pole, which is a is good horticultural practice. And he wanted to show me that he was he was up on the latest stuff. And this was my tour guide and my interpreter here. Um, and uh, while we were there, the local TV station came out and wanted to get a story, which was kind of fun. And so here's some of these high tunnels uh, prior to putting the plastic on. Right after they were built, they've got these cement support beams. Uh, the one individual I showed you, uh, he, he made these himself. So he had, you can see a stack of them over here. Here's the cement mixer. He's got them laid out here. And so very innovative, just, just building this stuff simply on their own. They're not buying it out of a nursery catalog or something. And then little raised beds. These are all grafted, grafted peach trees. Then they also had orchards uh, outside where they were growing them high density. And uh, there was always some other crop, like rape or something being grown in the middle so they could get two crops off the land. And they did have some planted high density like what we, some of our orchards here in South Carolina. As we were traveling along the road, I saw this couple. They were out getting ready to spray the peach trees. And uh, that was their spray rig. And for me, that was hard to watch because this is probably a husband and wife, and she's probably the one using the handgun. No respirator, no protective gear, nothing. So um, that was something that I felt, I felt bad about. But traveling along the road, uh, these ladies are all out working in the nursery with hoes, and most of the cultivation is done by hand with hoes. So they don't use a lot of herbicides because herbicides are expensive. While we were in uh, Dongshan County, there, we actually had a commercial peach grower extension meeting, something like what we'd have here in South Carolina. And I participated in this meeting and got to talk with these guys through my interpreter and actually was able to help them with some questions that they had about their operation. That was a lot of fun. We went out for lunch. 
And uh, while we're having lunch, um, they asked me questions about my family, so I gave my iPhone to the ladies, and they were scrolling through looking at pictures of my kids. And, you know, they're just people like us. They have children, they love their families, and we had a sweet time together. These were the wives of the growers that uh, we had uh, that meeting with. Um, actually, this is mislabeled. This is sheep ear. That was the first time I've ever had sheep ear. That was part of our lunch. Um, and then, as we're getting ready to leave the restaurant, the owner of the restaurant and his three sons who were helping him that night came and they wanted to get their picture with me, so we did that and that was fun. I guess it's not often that somebody from the United States would visit them. And then uh, for breakfast the next day, we're on the road and we have a, a specialty of Dangshan County. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's kind of like a mixture between lamb and venison and beef. And uh, it's, a, it's a cultivated animal. It is not a wild animal. Um, and then as you're going along the highway, you know, there's all these roadside markets, and this lady was selling chickens, and, and I don't know how old she is, but she looks to me like she's probably 80 years old, easily. I just thought that was a neat picture. Next stop was Zhengzhou, and uh, Zhengzhou is a city of about 8 million people. It's uh, um, a place that I visited before. This is the train station. Um, I gave a seminar at the institute there, and uh, Professor uh, Fan here, uh, someone that I've known for several years, and these are just some of his graduate students that came out to, to hear my presentation. He, I think he had about 20 graduate students, and that's normal for professors in China, somewhere around 20 graduate students. It's a staggering number when we consider what it's like for us here. Visited their germplasm collection. They have over a thousand cultivars of peaches at their particular institute. It's a germplasm repository, and what's interesting there is that they have some of these dwarfed sign cultivars, which we don't have in the States, and this tree is the same age as this one. And that's how compressed the inner nodes are uh, because of its natural dwarfing habits. So um, they're using that in breeding to create new cultivars that are have very short inner nodes so they can grow them in the greenhouse and not have to use a lot of pruning or chemicals to keep the plants small. This gentleman was a retired peach breeder there. And um, my dad is about the same age as him. And my dad is a retired peach breeder. And I got to spend time with him going around the orchard, and he was just showing me all of his crosses and the, the new cultivars that he's developed over the years, and it was just really a, a sweet time. I wish my father had been, could have been with me on that trip. We had a big banquet to say goodbye. Uh, this is Mr. New here. He was my tour guide. We, we enjoyed a really great feast before I left Zhengzhou. And just some of the interesting food we had. These are baby sweet potatoes. These are mushrooms that are uh, dipped in batter and then deep fried. This is a... This is a Let's see here, that was eggplant, and then spicy green beans, and this is pigtail. That's the first time I ever had pigtail. Uh, even in the, the very nice new airports they have in China, they still have flight delays like we have here in the States. And I got delayed on my flight to uh, Inchuan, but we, did, we got there eventually. And this is up here, it's uh, an autonomous region, and it is uh, primarily desert although they have the Yellow River that goes through there, which is their source of water. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Wong. He was really the one responsible for bringing me to China on this trip. We're visiting a grower here, and uh, that's a house where they would have grown nectarines there. You can see it's just dirt walls. Uh, this is looking at it from the northeast corner. And uh, they had some spring winds that did cause damage uh, to the plastic, as you can see here. And so that's what it looks like when you get a lot of sand on the fruit that obviously they should be under plastic and not have this. And then boxes that were prepared, uh, labeled, they're going to put the fruit in those boxes and the fruit are going to go to Beijing, they're going to go to Shanghai, they're going to go to Guangzhou, uh, to the city markets. And this is just interesting. This is an entrance to a greenhouse at a commercial grower facility. And then this is what it's like at the government facility. So you can see which one obviously costs more money. And at this particular government-owned facility that we visited here, there are about 3,000 houses. And um, you can see here some sand across the road. That's wind. That's wind erosion. So they, they've uh, put in special grass species that they plant in a certain way, and they've put these cinder block walls down at the end here to reduce the wind that will come through and cause the erosion. And uh, this is what the cinder block walls would look like. So this is the back corner of the greenhouse. This is the entrance here. 
And uh, they were growing table grapes there, uh, tomatoes. They did have supplemental heating, so you know they can afford this at a government-run facility, which is not like the private individual. Cherry tomatoes, bambino watermelons. And they had a master plan for this facility, so these are all the greenhouses here. And this is an amusement park. <laughs> so obviously tourism is a big part of this one. And these are the... Um, the lean-to type houses here on the left, and then these are the high tunnels on the right. They were growing apricots, plums. They had a very sophisticated uh, computer monitoring system, and every greenhouse had a uh, video camera that could be manipulated uh, remotely, and they could even zoom in on individual leaves on a grapevine from the computer. So it was very, very sophisticated. President Hu had visited there earlier in the year, and this is the man who runs the facility, and Obviously, they were very excited that the president came to visit their state-of-the-art facility. We did go sightseeing here. This is what the so this is what the, the scenery is like. It's just basically desert, but here's the river coming through, and we went to a special place where tourists go, and uh, we're up at the top of this hill, and they told me to get on this thing, and I, you know, trying to be a, a polite guest, I guess, I sat on this thing, and the next thing I know, they're pushing me down this hill, <laughs> and here I'm going. And, and that's not a genuine smile, that's fear. <laughs> because I got, I've got an expensive camera on my lap, and I got these two little things that I'm trying to figure out which are supposed to be brakes. And if you pull one too hard, it's, you're gonna flip over on the side. But I made it to the bottom. So that was, that was a little exciting. I've gone tobogganing a lot. I'm originally from Canada, and we do a lot of that, but not, never down a sand dune. And then once you get to the bottom, of course, you gotta get on a camel to get back up. So there's me on this camel. and. Uh, Anybody ever ride a camel before? It's, it's pretty wild. And they don't get up like this. They get up uh, uh, like that. And uh, you, you don't want to get too close, though, because they're very affectionate. So um, they might try and give you a kiss. Um, our driver, this guy here, uh, I didn't realize it. He had quite a sense of humor. And because I was a foreign guest, he wanted to give me a little bit of a thrill. This is my host here. He's a lot more serious guy. And uh, we're traveling around in this four-wheeler, and of course you can imagine there's sand dunes like everywhere. And so he's taking us out on his, his four-wheeler, and this, this uh, little thing is supposed to be normally hanging like this. And we're up and down over all these sand dunes, my head's bouncing off the window, and anyway, he was having a good laugh, and we had some fun together. <laughs> uh, we visited this famous historic site. It's, uh, it's a tomb where... Um, the officials and the royalty of the Shah dynasty are buried. It's, a, it's officially a mausoleum, uh, kind of like what you might think of the pyramids over in Egypt, and that was a very interesting experience. Just some of the scenery along the highway, this temple up here. Uh, there's a predominant Muslim population of uh, a minority group people there, the Hui, pe Hui people, and I did see several mosques in that part of China. And these are what the people look like. They're, they're a little bit shorter than the average uh, Han Chinese person. And here we are. This is a roadside market where they're selling fruits and vegetables in the morning. They're famous for goji berry. That's where the goji berry is grown. It's uh, uh, also called the red medlar. It's a very good antioxidant source. And that's the pr Zhongning is the primary place where this is grown in the world. Last stop was Beijing. Um, at the market, what was interesting uh, they had these uh, yellow nectarines in trays that had been grown in the greenhouse beside Washington Red Delicious Apples. And you can see on the surface of the fruit, there's a, sort of a squiggle here and a squiggle here, and it's yellow. What they did was they applied a decal to the fruit as it was small and it was growing, and it would obscure the sunlight so that that part of the fruit would not get red. And this is a symbol that's some kind of a greeting or a blessing that you would give as a gift to someone. And that's just another way to market fruit. This is my, my host in Beijing, uh, Wang Jiping and his wife. And we visited the Temple of Heaven there, which was a, a beautiful sight. And it was a beautiful spring day, and lots of people came out, and they were taking pictures. And I asked these folks if I could take their picture. This is a, a monk who was there visiting the temple. And these, these young guys out playing their acoustic guitars and singing a folk song. And I'd never, I didn't expect to see that, but I watched them for a while. And these soldiers, this, these guys here hardly look like they're old enough to be soldiers, but they're looking at pictures on his phone there. It's just fun to watch people that day. 
And this man is an artist, and he's just got a cup of water and a paintbrush, and he's painting characters on the, on the street there. And of course, it'll evaporate, and it'll disappear. So it's pretty ephemeral art, but it was fun to watch him. And then people selling uh, food on the roadside, barbecued hot dog kind of things. And uh, this is a, a, a typical snack. These are hawthorn fruits that are on a wooden stick and dipped into a uh, syrup. And then you pull it out, and it dries. It's kind of like a candied apple. And I had one of those. It was delicious. And I wondered if, if we got our candy apple from, from this. Maybe we did. And then just some of the beautiful greenhouse-grown fruit that was available in the market. Uh, just spectacular fruit. And then they, they put a, shoot, a couple of shoots from the tree just to indicate freshness. That's why those are in there. And that's the end. So I have all these folks here. I won't go all over all their names and where they're from, but it, the trip wasn't possible without my friends. Uh, they were terrific hosts to me. They taught me a lot, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to entertain them here in the future. Do I have time for any questions? Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I don't remember the name of the dam, but a very large dam that they put across the Yellow River. Is that making any difference in how they're trying to grow their crops? Uh, you mean the Three Gorges Dam? Yes. Well, it's a major source of energy. Um, but I don't, uh, in terms of the, the growers that are growing the protected cultivation green uh, peaches and nectarines and the other fruits and stuff, they're not really using energy at all. So they're, they're, they're basically using sun energy. They're not using electricity. So I didn't see electricity in any of these, any of these greenhouses. Does it make any difference for their water? Uh, for the water, um, well, they're, they're getting water whatever would be their nearest source, whether it was a river or uh, wells that were in the ground, something like that. Sean? Um, how did they access the, the top of the high tunnels, whether the mats down? Not the um, passive solar greenhouses. Not just the How do they access them? Yeah. Or did they, even, or did they have ropes they let the mats down? Yes. Down? They use ropes. And then uh, what about the disease pressure on the outdoor peaches? The peaches being native from Asia? Right. Do they have the same disease pressure? They have uh, leaf curl. They have bacterial spot. Um, brown rot. Yeah, they have brown rot. Um, do you think it was to the degree that we have in the south? Guido might have a better idea. You've talked. Have you talked with uh, your counterparts I've, over there? I've had quite a bit of problems with gamosis. Yeah, I did see gamosis in some of the trees outside. Yeah, and they've got a bunch of Virginia species, more than we do. Okay. And, uh, yeah. But when I talked with the commercial guys and asked them what their main things they were spraying for, uh, in the springtime they have a, a peach aphid, and that's really the one insecticide that they, that they typically put out. Um, both in the greenhouse and outside, but not a lot of pesticide application from what I, from what they told me. Do most of these uh, growers, that, just related to this question, do most of these growers use the little bags? In the not in the greenhouse. No, I mean out. out uh, the I, I wouldn't say it's a majority. Uh, where I saw that was uh, outside of uh, Shanghai. There were some orchards I visited where they had fruit bagged, <clears throat> and uh, the reason they bagged the fruit was because it was a yellow, a yellow flesh cultivar that they wanted to market with yellow skin. So they would bag the fruit, and that would keep the sunlight from causing the skin to turn red. And uh, they, then they pick the fruit off, and you've got this beautiful, perfect fruit with no blemishes on it, yellow skin, yellow flesh, and that's a particular market niche. Um, but you can imagine a lot. We, it would take a, a very unique operation in South Carolina to have even the, be able to be willing to pay the labor to go out and put all those bags on. Um, so I think they've got a unique situation there. Yes? Is there no interest? I mean, it seems to be pretty successful in China. Is there no interest in doing this type of system here in Southeastern? <clears throat> there is interest, and I've been, I've been speaking at different grower meetings this winter talking about it. Uh, I know of one grower in Vermont who's who's doing this with peaches. He's got what are called uh, donut peaches, which are the flat. I don't know if you've ever seen this in the market, the flat peaches. He's doing those organically, and he's selling those for about $6 a pound, so is which is any, excellent money. Is there any access to where they can get plans, simple plans, to build these types of greenhouses? Like, for yes. 
yeah, that information is out, is out there. Some of it we probably have to get translated, but the simple schematics of how to build something like it's really not that that complicated. Calvin. Taste and texture. Good. Yeah. Um, the difference is that the the Asians typically prefer low acid type stone fruits. So they don't have as much acidity as, as a typical southern peach. Uh, and in the greenhouse, most of the time, the, the soluble solids or the bricks, the sugar level is a little bit lower than if you grew that same cultivar outside in full sun. But what they're doing is they're actually breeding for higher quality for cultivars to be grown in the greenhouse. So they're actually breeding them and evaluating them in the greenhouse to see how well they perform, and then they're selecting the best ones from that. So another thing that they're trying to do is um, the mid-season cultivars that they normally grow outside that are very high eating quality, they're growing those very good quality cultivars in the greenhouse, which pushes them earlier. So they've got a pretty good fruit to start with because a lot of the early season cultivars that you grow outside are typically marginal, like what we have here. Is, they really aren't that good. You know. Pardon? No. 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 Not that I was told or saw. So what? Sorry. the marketing outside China. A little bit by air to some of the Pacific Rim, and that would be really high quality fruit like these cherries that I showed you. They would put in a styrofoam container and they'd go to Japan maybe. But most of it's consumed within the country. 